After Bhagavan had liberated his mother in May 1922 at Skandashram, he made a rather surprising statement that was noted by T.P. Ramachandra Iyer, who later became the ashram lawyer, to the effect that he would have been happy at that time if the mother's body had been taken away secretly and buried in an unmarked grave so that no one could make a big deal out of it. Kanju Swami, a long time ago, he was there at the time why these instructions were not carried out. And he shrugged his shoulders and said, well, it wasn't really practical. Every, everybody knew that the mother was dying. Everybody was waiting for news to see was she going to survive that day. And the moment she did pass away, all the devotees in town knew they were all coming up the hill. Everybody was involved one way or the other. The, the idea that we could have done something secretly is simply not plausible, not practical. We, we had to put on a show because that's what everyone demanded. So the following morning, relatives had been notified, they came up from Majurai. The body, the body was brought down here and it was buried with full ceremonial honours, more or less directly under where I'm sitting right now. The head of the local village down here, who was also a devotee, suggested this particular site. The original idea was to bury her closer to the road. In those days that was a kind of common burial ground for sadhus, and it was thought that it would be appropriate to put his mother in with the other sadhus. But then this uh, village official said, if you locate the temple here, then there's a possibility that later you'll be able to construct a proper temple over her remains. Inside this one building, which was the only building the ashram had for some time, there was a division. On one side was the place where the mother was buried and where various rituals were done to hit her body. And as an adjunct to that, there was a small room where Bhagavan lived, slept and met with devotees who happened to come. So I think it's a little appreciated fact that Bhagavan himself actually lived in the first mother's temple and lived there for, I would say, about five years before he moved to the new hall sometime in 1928. Some point between when the first coconut leaf hut was erected and Bhagavan moving to the new hall, a brick maker in Palakotu had abandoned a big pile of bricks there. In India, you make bricks by making rectangular blocks by hand in a mold and then spreading them out in the sun to dry. Once they've dried, they're stacked up into a large house-like structure. Fires are lit underneath and the heat is retained by plastering the whole of the outside with wet mud, which dries and bakes. This ensures that the wood inside burns like charcoal at a much higher temperature than ordinary wood and it ensures a good bake all the way through the mud pile. That is, unless it happens to rain during the baking. If it rains, then the fires are extinguished and the full baking process isn't accomplished. That means that some or all of the, prick, all of the bricks are not of a commercial quant quant quality and they tend to be abandoned and just left in people's fields. This is what happened with this brick maker adjacent to the ashram land. Bhagavan noticed that these bricks were lying around, that no one seemed to want them, and his parsimonious habit kicked in, and he thought, well, we, we can use those bricks, we can use them to make a proper brick structure around the samadhi of the mother. So he informed all the devotees that that's what they were planning to do. Everybody in the ashram and a large corps of volunteers from town came one night and they stood in a, one in a long line, a chain line, and they handed these partially cooked bricks from hand to hand, relocating the entire collection from Pelakatu to a site just adjacent to the mother's samadhi. The following day, the first brick building was constructed on top of the mother's remains. Bhagavan was asked to do the work on the inside. Bhagavan loved work, by the way. That was the, the kind of job he would have loved doing. Because he was a Brahmin and because he, he was, of course, a Jnani, they thought someone, somebody special ought to be doing the inside of the temple. So Bhagavan volunteered, got his trowel out, and did the bricklaying and the plastering on the inside of the shrine. Ordinary 
masons from town did the work on the outside. The first roof was another thatch building, uh, later that was converted into tile and I think by the early 1930s a kind of uh, madras terrace construction appeared on top. But the original building were comprised brick walls personally constructed by Bhagavan in a little cubicle over the mother's lingam. Jinnaswamy, who was running the ashram from 1929 onwards, he was a big fan of the mother's temple and he really wanted a big upgrade to the temple facilities, to the building itself, to reflect the importance that he attached to the mother's temple within the ashram community. Now it's very interesting that Bhagavan generally didn't interfere in matters of ashram management. He didn't say who could stay here, he didn't say who could eat. He had a very hands-off approach, but on the matter of buildings he took absolute control and he never ever ceded any of that control to Chinnaswamy, his brother. He would decide when new buildings would go up, he would decide on what scale they would be constructed, he would also decide what materials they would be made out of, and he would also decide who would be in charge of constructing them. Throughout the entire building program of the 1930s, it was Anamale Swami who was generally put in charge of all the buildings in the ashram, and he had to report to Bhagavan every day and get his instructions from Bhagavan, not from Chinnaswamy. So Chinnaswamy was a little bit left out of the, of the loop on this, but he was hoping that at some point Bhagavan would announce either to Chinnaswamy himself or to people in general that it was time for an upgrade of the mother's temple. He wanted a big grandiose temple built along traditional Vedic lines. No one had ever managed to get an opinion out of Bhagavan as to what scale he envisaged the new temple would be, um, let alone when it should start. Bhagavan didn't believe in consultations, he didn't believe in planning processes. He would just get out of bed one morning, the self would say, it's time for a cow shed or it's time for a new office. He would call an Amle Swami and say, start digging. And that would be irrespective of whether the ashram had any funds or not. When Bhagavan decided it was time for a new building, a new building would start and that was that. So there was no discussion over the scale, there was no real planning going on, but there were some very pointed discussions which took place in Bhagavan's hall, with Bhagavan listening, over whether ashram funds should be allocated to a very expensive temple over the mother's remains, or whether they should be used for more practical purposes, buying land to feed the ashram. In the 1930s, the ashram not only suffered from a lack of funds to buy food, there were also government regulations which prohibited the movement of rice from one area to another. So on big festival days, there were various kinds of slightly illegal mass smugglings. Devotees were asked to bring vans, trucks, bullock carts of rice from wherever, from wherever they lived to help with the feeding at Raman Ashram because it simply wasn't possible for Raman Ashram legally to buy all the food that they needed to cater to the people. So one obvious solution would be to use any available funds to buy rice fields in the neighbourhood of Tiruvannamalai and use those fields to grow enough rice to meet the increasing needs of the ashram. These debates would go on, sometimes quite heatedly in Bhagavan's presence. He would, know, he would show no sign of favouring one side or the other, and he wouldn't even show any sign that he'd listened to the arguments and formed an opinion. He would just stare into space while all these discussions went on around him. By 1939, just about every major building in the ashram had been finished, except for the temple, and no one had the slightest idea what Bhagavan wanted, when he wanted to do it, and so on. So in desperation, Chinnaswamy went to Anamle Swami and said, Bhagavan seems to be telling you his plans for the ashram buildings. He's not talking to me about them. He's not talking to anybody else. When it's time for a new ashram building, you're, you seem to be the person he goes to. Why don't you at least go and ask him what plans he has for the temple, what scale it should be built on, whether we should have a big one or a small one, and so on. 
we don't have to ask, ask him to fix a date, just find out what his idea is for the mother's temple. So Anamale Swami thought, why not? And he, he told Bhagavan that Chinnaswami had make, been making inquiries about this. And Bhagavan, for the first time, made a public pronouncement and said, if it is built very big, very well, on a large scale, I will be very happy. So this was a major policy pronouncement by Bhagavan. It completely altered the face of Ramanashram. It showed his direct endorsement for a large shrine over the mother's remains. Chinnaswami was, of course, delighted. Uh, he set about making all the necessary preparations, which involved hiring temple architects. This wasn't a job for an ordinary engineer. It wasn't a job for someone such as Anamle Swami, because temples are built according to very ancient prescribed rules that only temple builders know uh, and the technical workers they bring along have very specialized skills so you can't employ general workers and you can't employ a general engineer to build them so an outside uh, temple engineer was brought in and for the next 10 years he supervised all the work on the temple and very occasionally if there were small jobs to be done that he thought a non-specialist person could do, he would point them out to Anamale Swami and ask him to rectify what he thought were minor errors or some shoddy construction standards that were going on. He was asked to grout some of the paving stones to a better standard. And at one point he was even asked to make a stencil for the name of the temple over the principal entrance, which is straight down from where I am now. If you go through the new hall, through the next entrance, immediately in front of you there are some steps going up to the inner shrine. If you look up, there are some carved elephants over the entrance. And on the bottom, there are some Sanskrit words written. So Bhagavan decided that he was going to personally write these Devanagari characters on a piece of cardboard. And he asked Anamle Swami to sit in the old hall and cut out a stencil which would could then be painted on the bottom of the frieze where these elephants were so that later the temple um, sculptors could come and chip, chip out these Sanskrit letters. I think this was just something Bhagavan decided that day he was going to do. So he made the stencil, he gave it to Anamle Swami to cut out and Anamle Swami said it was a very delicate job, he had to sit there with a lot of attention while he was halfway through, also he didn't know Devanagari of course, being a Tamil. Halfway through this, Bhagavan got up to go to the bathroom and everybody got up except for Anamale Swami who was halfway through a letter. And Bhagavan must have heard somebody mutter, look at that man, he's got no respect, he's, he's, not, he's not standing up. So uh, Bhagavan controlled his bladder for another half hour and came, came and sat next to Anamale Swami and looked at these letters while Anamale Swami did them properly according to Bhagavan's instructions and then he went out. So this, this is, these are just two small examples of how Bhagavan had a minor involvement in the various small details of the temple that interested him and how he occasionally got non-temple labour to do jobs that he thought were, was, were important.